we didn't have the opportunity to record the communion and Bible study together, so we're proffering separately each one of those, and perhaps later you'll be able to see the communion service for this particular week that we are celebrating. But Romans, as we look at and as we study it every week on Wednesday night right now, going through it verse by verse, intensely looking and studying to see those things that God would reveal to us, to listen to his voice and to ask God, what do you want for us to hear? What do you want us to know? How can we make this a part of our life today, practically in a way that will make sense for us to be studying and to hearing from and learning from you, God? Because if it's not practical, why are we doing it? If it's not personal, how come we're here? If we're not actually hearing you and seeing you move in our lives, why are we calling ourselves Christians? Interestingly enough is that in this book that we're looking at, Romans, if you want to know about America, read the book of Romans. It's very simple. It doesn't take a genius to figure out that, quite frankly, the book of Romans is the book of Americans. Roman culture permeates and is an integral part of our society. Most of our government is built upon the Roman module. Almost all of our business free enterprise system is built upon a type of Roman enterprise that was built upon the Babylonian module. There's a lot to be said about the fact that we have a lot of building structures, a lot of our monetary system, a lot of our governmental system, a lot of our mores, a lot of our freedoms, a lot of our privileges, a lot of our rights, all based upon Roman law. You could say that we're Roman American, as much as the Catholic Church became known as the Roman Catholic Church. So it's fascinating to me to read the book of Romans and to see in it me, to see my lifestyle that I'm living this day as I'm going about each day to follow Jesus in a personal way. When I see that and I recognize that, I know that God has allowed history to repeat itself in cycles or that there seems to be a full circle of things happening until the actual fulfillment comes about, to which the end of the like, greatest fulfillment will be when Jesus comes again. But until then, we do see civilizations seem to go through patterns. They seem to go through habits. They seem to go through the same steps before they rise and fall, before they are the leaders or the followers, before they are the center of attention or the back burners of God's presence. And we see that throughout the world as it started in Jerusalem, where at one time that was the center of attention for Christianity, where Jesus died and Jesus rose. In the book of Acts, we see much happening. Then it seemed to move around to different places. You know, Alexandria and Egypt, you know, brought some heresies. Um, <clears throat> Constantinople, you know, in the Catholic Church with the Eastern Orthodox. Uh, Russia at one time, then later to Germany, also to Rome from there to Europe, from Europe to America, from America to now we see maybe Africa and some other nations where great revivals are going on and dying out quickly, just as fast too. But we see that things seem to be happening in Israel again. And perhaps we are living in a very, very precarious time when no longer is America the apple of God's eye, but that God has shifted his focus and his attention back on his people the children of Israel. Because I say the children of Israel because the nation itself is apostate. Israel as a nation, if you're standing with, you're foolish because they frankly don't believe in God. They don't want God, they don't believe in God, and they don't want to have anything to do with God because they would rather self-determine their own destiny than to choose to follow the living God. They will prove out why God has to send Moses and Elijah very soon now, very soon in our lifetime, how they have already imprisoned Christian missionaries for witnessing the gospel to the Jew. They have already placed Jews for Jesus, of all people, in jail for being a witness to a Jew. You see, it's illegal in Israel to witness or to convert a Jew from Judaism or from being apostate or any other religion to Christianity. Why that is the only occasion is an interesting teaching. 
But one of the things that we find here in America is an occasion of the same isolation that's happening. Those that choose to follow Jesus in a particular personal and peculiar way are finding themselves under condemnation. When we say that we have to love our enemies, we're being persecuted by our Christian brothers for having to say, look, Jesus said it. What do you mean you want to hate the gay community or you want to hate the homosexual or you hate the government or you want to take your guns and you want to do violence upon your brother? Have you not read? Have you not heard? Did Jesus not say to love your enemies? Blessed are you if you are persecuted for righteousness sake? Or did he say to go out and assert your rights and privileges? Because you see, the Roman law was one of, you stand up for your own rights. You're a Roman citizen. And Paul asserted that in the book of Acts. And we see where that got him. Eventually, he winds up in Rome, chained between guards in the house of Caesar. Eventually to witness as a testimony. But... You could make a case whether it was God's will or Paul's will, and whether God used Paul's will to accomplish his own will. It's kind of an interesting case that's made sometimes, because we do see Paul, interestingly enough, sometimes doing against what God told him to do, and still doing what God said to do anyways. For instance, he was sent to the Gentiles, yet we see him witnessing to the Jew. And every time he witnessed to the Jew, he caused a riot. <laughs> Imagine that for a testimony. But in the book of Romans, we see more so about the life of the Christians that were living and alive at the time that Jesus was on this earth. And the church had just begun to go into persecution. And those things that were happening in Rome with those Christians who were assembled there, who knew and were receiving letters from Paul and from other Christians about what the faith was, what the faith is, and what the faith was going to be. Because most Christians didn't know what Jesus said. They didn't have all the Gospels. They had some of what Jesus taught. As a matter of fact, the most famous things that was passed around at the time, believe it or not, was the Sermon on the Mount. Now you know why most early Christians were more like early Christians than we are in our latter days. You see, those who teach nonviolence these days are treated as wrong, false, misled, deceived. When in reality, that's what the first early church Christians were about. Nonviolent means. They did not have and carry swords in order to go out and do battle. As a matter of fact, they objected to the idea of going to war. They objected to the idea of being a soldier. They objected to the idea of following after those things of the world. That if you were in those vocations, if you were a soldier, they said, well, you know, do what you got to do, but, you know, follow God. And then if God tells you, you know, if you get ready to kill someone, you may have to take a choice between whether you obey God or obey Caesar. And there is Roman centurions that we have recorded in history that have chosen to obey God rather than obey man. And they have stepped out of following Caesar, following the army's rules, and quit being with the army and went to be with the Christians and died with them. Now to me... I think that's a pretty clear teaching. I don't know what American Christianity has done today and gone off on a tangent to say, well, you know, it's okay, carry your guns and protect yourself and to do all these things that are not taught in Scripture. I mean, we're told to trust in the Lord. So I'm not quite sure where or why we believe, some Christians do anyways, in this violent means to solve a spiritual matter. The attitude of the heart was supposed to be one of loving your enemies. And if you can tell me that you can love your enemy by shooting him, I really want to know how. Because you'll have to come and explain it to me because I don't see it in Scripture. I don't see the Word of God teaching me anywhere, at any place in time, in any shape or form, to go join the military. At all. I don't see one instance of it. Period. And I can't find it in church history either. I can find it in the religion of Christianity where the church produced its own armies and went out and killed people and even the witchcraft, you know, where they were killing Christians that they didn't like and blaming witchcraft on them, supposedly. I can see lots of times where the church wanted to get rid of people they didn't like, so they went ahead and accused them of heresy and false teaching and killed them in the name of God. But I don't see exactly anywhere in Jesus' teachings where he tells you to go out and join the army, join the Navy, join the Marines, join any kind of military service. 
As a matter of fact, I was taught in my day, if you can't do anything else, join the military. They'll take you. I mean, worst comes to shove, push comes to shove, be a Marine, which I did. I signed up. Thank God, God got me out. Praise the Lord. You know, I would have been failing of the grace that I was given. So we're not called to be in the Army. We're not called to be in the football team. We're not called to be in this wealthy 2% in America that is wealthier than everybody in the world. As a matter of fact, our poorest is wealthier than some of the richest. That's scary thought, isn't it? Our poor are wealthier than some of the richest in other countries. Jesus made some very clear statements that at the end of this age, at the end of the world, that now that we've come into our own inheritance and we've seen what happened when we took our freedoms and we said, we want to be free and we want everyone else to be free, what freedom has done to us. The gay community, the homosexual community, the LGBT, everyone else that we've ever oppressed now has gotten involved in that ability to have a voice. The ability to have freedom of speech, the ability to seek life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The ability to go after those things that Christian America says it's theirs only and not for everyone. And now that everyone else is participating in it, unfortunately, Christendom has found out they don't like it. Because they got involved in politics and because they reaped to the wind, they have sown, they sown to the wind, they have reaped to the whirlwind. And now they hate what has become of their nation because they have chosen to get involved where God never sent them. And they reap the harvest. And the harvest is not what they wanted it to be. But everybody's free. And everybody's seeking health, happiness, and the pursuit of thereof. Everybody's wanting to get these things that they think are going to make them happy. Now, i got news for you. The person who's an abortion you know, or having an abortion, they're miserable. They're not having an abortion because they like it. They're having an abortion because they have no solution. The person who's going into and making sexual choices and deviations or corrections of their own sexual... Um, preferences as well as their sexual or their orientation of how they were born by changing the way that they were born are not happy. That's obvious because they're choosing something alternative to what was normative. When you choose alternative to normative, you're not happy. You're looking for something, but I can tell you, the gay community is not going to find what they're looking for. The LGBT community will not find what they're looking for. The Muslim, the Christian, the born-again Christian, the Americanized Christian, the person who's looking for political, social, emotional, or physical solutions in America are not going to find what they're looking for. Because just like in the book of Romans, we're going to see, as we read this, you're only going to find the solution in one person, in one God, in one way, and that's Jesus. The Christian doesn't have the answer when he's pointing to the government. The Christian doesn't have the answer when he's pointing to church. The Christian doesn't have the answer when he's pointing to himself. As a matter of fact, he's fooling himself and he's fooling the person that's listening to them. The only answer that a person has is when anyone and everyone at any time and anywhere and every place and everywhere that they can, they reach out and cry out to God Almighty and say, help me. And that includes the murderer. That includes the child molester. That includes the pedophile. That includes the gay person. That includes the government. That includes everyone that you hate that can reach out and say, God save me. And he will. Because you see, it's not for you to determine a person's salvation and it's not for you to determine how they be saved. That's God's department. What you're called to do is be a witness and a testimony to make disciples of all nations. Not to change them, rearrange them, or make them into anything else than what God has said they are to be. And I'll tell you, God and them will work that one out, and you can't. So I would say to you, be careful. When you look at the Roman culture and the way that the book of Romans is written, it's not about your ability to condemn someone, but it's about your ability to conform yourself to the word of God and to accept what Jesus has done and what Jesus is doing today to the community that's in America. To say to them, I come not to bring condemnation, but salvation before it's too late. 
I come to bring salvation unto all those who would call upon the name of the Lord to be saved. I have come that they might have life and life more abundantly in this world as well as life to come eternally in the next. For surely God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. But though they should not perish, they could perish. Should they choose to not listen to what I say, not obey my voice, not take care of the poor, not forgive, not be merciful, not be kind, not be peaceable, not be loving. The warning is there. We're reading of it in Romans. We're studying it intensely. It should be a reality in your life that you know factually that God never said to go get a gun. You should know that. Actually, that God never said to go out and to hate your enemy or your neighbor or your friend or your relative. You should know factually that God said you can and you should and you better know and hear his voice. Because if you don't, you'll be deceived. You should know factually that God is going to fulfill his word and that you might be that fulfillment whether you think you're saved, whether you know you're saved, or whether you want to be saved. Because not everyone that calls upon the name of the Lord is saved. The fact is... That everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, and some may go into great tribulation in order to accomplish that. Some may be left behind in order to be, quote unquote, given the opportunity for salvation, because they have not been saved yet. Are you one of those? Because I don't know who's saved and who's not. If you have the Son, you have life. If you have not the Son of God, you have not life. What comes out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Where's your heart at? Can you hate the president? If you can, you're going into great tribulation because you're not saved. You're not the wise virgin. You're not peaceable. You're not loving. You're not joy-filled. You're not moving according to being led by the Spirit of God. You don't have the fruits of the Spirit in your life. Do you hate the Muslim? You're not going in the rapture. You're not going to be taken away because guess what? Those that have not cleaned up their act aren't prepared and aren't ready. They'll fall asleep, but they'll wake up and they're not full of the Holy Spirit. What does the Holy Spirit tell you to do? Convict people of sin? No. He does. You don't. You don't. You see, to whom is given grace, much more grace is extended if we give grace. But to whom is given little grace, that little grace they've got will be taken away. Yeah. What little measure you have will be removed. Because you have saving grace. God knows you need it. And so do I. But to get more grace, you have to give more grace. You have to give away what little bit you got, and you'll get more. And the more that you forgive, the more that you love, the more that you have peace, the more that you have joy, the more that you're able to extend your hands outward and love on those who are perishing, as Jesus did, and say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, and willing to die for them. Then I dare say to you, guess what? You're saved. Otherwise, plan on great tribulation. You're going to go for it. You're going to get it. And so we're looking in the book of Romans. We're studying Romans as being the book that's written to us, as though it were part of our life, because it is our life. This is who we are, Romans. And so reading in verse 1 of chapter 1, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle separated unto the gospel of God, which he had promised aforetime by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead, by whom you have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. Now that's the scripture we want to look at. You know, and then it says in verse 6, Among whom are you also called, are the called of Jesus Christ? And then in verse 7, To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to look at, as we consider this, because we're, you know, getting very intense about Romans, and we've been looking at each line and each word and whatever God, the Holy Spirit, has wanted to make practical in our lives for that day. We have chosen to exemplify it and to speak on it and to witness and bear witness to it that that's what we need this day. I want to look at verse 5 where it says, By whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. Are you obedient to the faith among all nations? 
What are you doing to the Muslim? Now, I can understand this. Let's make the point clear so we know where we're going and what we're doing and how we apply it. We're saying in verse 5, we've received grace. Now, I'm not saying that this is just a, some decalogue or some prologue that's only for Paul and it's only for the Romans. I'm saying it's written to you. So, by the Spirit of God, I pray, Father, in the name of Jesus, that you would give us your spirit, that we should have ears to hear, that we would have eyes to see, and we would know that you have spoken these things for us today, and that the Spirit of God will teach us and lead us and guide us and remove from us all sin in Jesus' name. Amen. And so we would know that God, by his Spirit, is speaking to you. You. Just like he's speaking to me. Me. Just like he's speaking to anyone and everyone who really has ears to hear what the Spirit of God would say to them. Because if you don't, you won't. You won't not only be able to hear it, you won't be able to do it. You won't be able to live it. You won't be able to accomplish it. So you have to ask God to help you. You have to have His Spirit inside you. You have to be born again. If you're not born again and you're not a Christian, then go away. You're not going to learn anything from this. It's not going to apply to you. You're going to always be reminded that you're missing out on what God is all about. So unless you become born again to the Spirit, it's just flesh for you. It's only working on the outside. And that's what most Christians in America and American Christianity is all about. Outward manifestations, never anything on the inward change. It's always about what's happening on the outside. What do you think a gun is? A gun only works on the outside. It doesn't work on the inside. You can't change anything about somebody's heart with a gun, can you? So what are you doing with a gun? Nothing. You're fleshing out. Every man, woman, and child that goes out and buys a gun for protection or buys it for some stupid reason that they think they need it is fleshing out, and you can operate according to the flesh, but you're a fleshy Christian. That's all it is, pure and simple. There's no doubt about it. You can't compromise. You can't lie. You can't debate. There's no reason to own a gun, and even when you say that you're buying it for meat, that's debatable, and you know it as well as I do. How many guns do you have? Because every time you find a guy that's out there with a gun for meat, he's got six guns. He don't have six meats. <laughs> Sorry. doesn't work that way. So my point is this. We know the times we live in. We know why the Romans did what they were. They were a warrior people. They were violent by nature. They liked their guns and their violence. So do you. If you have a gun, if you're possessing a gun, and if you're operating according to that flesh. But we want to make the point very clear here. You have received grace. You have received apostleship. Yeah, you. Apostleship also can mean that person who goes out and teaches, preaches, reaches, and sanctifies and sanctifies the Word of God by telling someone about it, which is what God said for you to do. He said, go out and teach all nations, baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You're meant to be not just one of the 12 apostles. You're meant to be one of the billions of apostles, the ministers of God, the people of God, the priests or a kingdom of priests is what we were supposed to be. And what we're becoming is a kingdom of killers which is what we actually are in the book of Romans and what we are in America. We're more of a killer because we're willing to open our mouth and protest, contest, argue, debate, slam, sham, state factually that we lie about people regularly, and we can't even tell the truth because we want to admit the truth of what we are. And that's the kind of person we are, sinners. But because we're sinners saved by grace, we've been received grace, and now we've received apostleship by Jesus Christ who died for us commissioned us and laid his life down for us that we should be likened unto him. We should be like Jesus. So because we are received of grace and we've called to be saints, that it says in verse 7, but because we'll go back and look at verse 6 and says, or verse 5, that it says we are apostleship for obedience. And there's a reason. So why are we called to be, why have we received grace and why are we called to be apostles? For obedience to the faith among all nations. Remember that phrase, obedience to the faith among all nations. Because it goes back to what Jesus said to do in Matthew. Go into all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. What is the faith? Baptizing them. What is the faith? Go and make disciples of all nations. Both. Luke, Matthew, Mark, John. Look at it. What's the commission? It's not the great commission. It's what God has commissioned you to be and commissioned you to do. If you've gone out and got a job that gets in the way, that job is in the way. If you've gone out to get a vocation that's in the way, that vocation is in the way. 
Don't tell me your vocation is part of your avocation of following through with what Jesus told you to do. Because you're not. You're using your job as an excuse to get away with what you want by getting so much money, you can spend it any way you want to, honey, and you're doing it just the way you want to. Just like the moms in Rome, just like the Roman centurions, just like the Roman tax collectors, just like those that were involved in America. Because American free enterprise is the book of Romans. American, the idea of entrepreneurship and the idea of getting it now and spending it and the millennial idea of getting our monies, you know, and spending it the way we want to. Book of Romans, pure and simple. I want to be the rock star. I want to have the lights on my name, Marquis. I want to be like up there in the banners. Oh, I won't admit it. Of course, you know, I'm, I'm humble because I won't admit it. No, you're a liar. It's right, you're a humble, but you're a humble liar. Because you do want it, and that's the fact. Everyone in their flesh wants to be the head honcho. As a matter of fact, Jesus warned about these latter days that, you know what? All these things do the Gentiles seek after. They want to be in charge. They want to have money. They want to buy their own clothes. They want to do their own thing. They want to have fame and fortune. And they want to exercise lordship over one another. Tell me how that's not the American dream. I'm sorry. The Bible teaches that the American dream, the American ideal, the American theology is false. It's not the way of Eastern Christianity. It's not the way of Judeo-Christianity. It's not what Jesus said to do. He said, how hard is it for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven? And yet everyone I know, anyone I know, is more than willing and happy to be a rich man. If I were a rich man. And yet that's the stupidest thing that you could do to a Christian. You want to wipe out a church? Make it prosperous. And you'll see that it becomes less and less effective gradually. You want to wipe out a Christian? Watch and give them prosperity and see what happens to them. Suddenly they don't have as much time, you know, to be in the ministry or to go to the poor people. Sorry, we got other things to do. Got to build up our house and our home and our cars, you know, cars. Zzzz. We got to have our Christian cruises, you know, and our Christian pilgrimages. You know, we got to do all these things because after all, we got so much money, we can do it now. So we might as well spend it on ourselves. Shouldn't we? It's our money, isn't it? For obedience to the faith among all nations. When we look at that scripture and we see that we're supposed to make disciples, when we see that scripture in Romans and it says that Paul is writing this letter to these guys to tell them about what he wants them to do and also to reveal to them what they have done and to reveal with them what they could do better, we begin to recognize that we need to do something about our lives. We need to see if we haven't fallen into the same place that Paul is writing to us about. That Paul, by way of inspired of God, by the Holy Spirit giving us ears to hear what the Word says, might be telling us as Americans in the book of Romans, that is exactly like America today, that we need to be obedient to the faith among all nations. Because what is the faith? If you ask other nations, they'll tell you who Jesus is. Ask someone who's not an American what Jesus is like. And you're going to get a shocking description. Because it's the stories you've heard, but it's not the way that you're living. Is it? Is it? Be honest. That's why we're looking at this. We want to be honest. We want to take something practical about one point here and to say to ourselves the first point that's very simple. A, here's, well, here's the first point. A, we've received grace. We're saved. Are you? If you're not, go away. Don't watch this. Go get saved. Get, you know, ask God into your life right now. Ask God to forgive you. Say, God, help me. I don't care what it takes. Save me. Bingo. You're saved. So now, we've received grace. I just gave you grace. See, grace for grace. So I said, you're saved. You know, you're saved. Grace by Jesus Christ. What he's done, what he accomplished, what he already worked out. Your sanctification, you'll figure out what he did by what you learn, as you learn and when you learn. But you won't know that until you finally learn it. So, as far as say is concerned, God's taking care of it. You're on your way. So, you've received grace. Now, because you've received grace, that's the number one point. We've received grace. All of us. We got grace. Now that we got it, what do we do? We've received apostleship. That means we got something to do. We've got an office to fulfill. We've got a purpose. We're being sent out. We are the sent ones. We are called out, and that's what the church means, 
called out ones, and we are then called out for a purpose to be trained, brought up, taught, and prepared for the ministry, and sent out ones. Because that's what apostleship is. It's a sent out one. It's a person like a missionary that goes out and does the purpose of what God set it to do. But what for? For obedience to the faith among all nations. You're sent out to the nations to be obedient to the faith, which is what Jesus said to do, which is what is your faith? I mean, really. I know what mine is, but what's your faith? Do you have faith in the Constitution? Boy, are you in for a shock. How many times again get revised? And did you know that it's a utopianism document? It's not about God. It's used for God, but it's not about God. No, it's directly about a declaration of independence. I hate to say this, but I think it's called like a rebellion against authority would be also another way of putting it. Be careful. Your declaration of independence is saying, I don't need anybody. Whoa. Be careful what you think the declaration of independence is. You haven't looked at it very closely or really examined it impartially. Be honest. It's a declaration of independence against kingly autocratic authority. And yet, God had set some king. The people chose kings to begin with. God didn't want people to have kings. But the Declaration of Independence is also a declaration of independence of God. Because there's later on in some of the rights that are attached to it as part of the document saying that there should be no establishment of religion. But also at the time allowing for all other religions, cults, to be existing. Yeah. It's the freedom of satanic worship. Oh, Declaration of Independence. Not a good thing. Sorry. It doesn't say that there's an establishment of, you know, the Ten Commandments. No, as a matter of fact, Ten Commandments tell you that there's an isolationism of that, quote-unquote, freedom. You don't have freedom according to Ten Commandments. No, you don't. But according to the Declaration of Independence, you do in the Constitution itself. It sets up for a societal normalcy, not a Christian one. A societal normalcy of opposing peoples and opinions that could express themselves within the reality of a democratic Roman government. Do you understand where you're coming from? What kind of faith do you have? Is your faith wrapped up in your job? You know, the free enterprise system where, well, you know, okay, I got it, Michael. I understand I shouldn't be a politician, you know, and I, I understand the historical significance of, you know, what they were doing back in the 1700s. But what about me today? You know, man, I, I'm just trying to earn a living. Earn a living. Did you ask God to lead you? Did you ask God to provide for you? Jesus said, you don't realize that if God can so clothe the sparrows and the birds of the air and feed the fish in the sea, aren't you more than these? Can't God do that for you? Or does God have to use free enterprise and commercialization and industrialization in order to give you a job? Couldn't you be provided for some other way? Well, I don't think so. That's right. Think. So really, in the bottom line, we still have to keep asking ourselves, are we obedient to the faith? Because what are we doing with our life? Is our life as a demonstration to the angels in heaven, the example of faith, or the reality of living a life according to the flesh? Because you know as well as I do, if we were honest about this statement here, obedience to the faith, we would have to say, well, my faith's not like Paul. I, when I became a Christian, I, I signed on so that I could just be, you know, like a janitor in the church. So I just sweep, you know, and I clean up after the people. That's my faith. That's okay with God. That's what God has gifted me with. Can you find that in there? Really? Wow. What's the first thing he told you to do? Receive grace, be an apostle, obedience to the faith among the nations. Oh, you may retire and become a janitor. But do you think he starts you off that way? Do you think that God can't provide for you to be out there in the way that he wants you to be? Do you think that you're called because you're a Christian to just simply slide by? Because, you know, I, we mentioned that at the very beginning about the you know, ten virgins, you know, I mean, you, you, you may be one of them virgins, you know, you, you might know Jesus. You might even be smart enough to be looking for Jesus coming again. I'm impressed. Dig it. 
Now you got a 50-50 chance of being there in the Great Tribulation, or 50-50 chance of being there condemned, yeah. or 50-50 chance of, you know, like, being snatched away, or being taken away, or being saved, or being quickly removed from the situation. Are you in the faith? Do you have faith like Peter? Like Paul? Like James? Like John? Faith like Jesus? What kind of faith do you have? Are you, in fact, being obedient today? Because really, if you're honest, you have to ask yourself that. Am I actually being obedient in the faith to where the nations could look at me, even the angels in heaven, even God Almighty himself, and look at me right now, and I could say, I'm faithful. I'm a faithful witness. By golly, I'm faithful and true. I'm one of them Duck Dynasty worshipers. I swear by the duck's call, you know, that I can do it all. Because guess what? I don't have to be loving. I can just say I love them, you know. And by golly, just because, you know, I grew up in the 60s, I could act like that I grew up in the 30s, you know, and pretend that I grew up in the East, you know, and act like that I don't know what went on in the West and pretend that I got it all because I can just say I love everybody. I love them all. You're going to hell, gays, community, but you know, I love you, but I don't like you. Okay. What did Jesus say? It wasn't a duck call. What did Jesus say? Are you obedient to the faith? And what faith are we talking about? You see, Jesus had to put his faith somewhere too. Jesus had to put his trust in someone. Jesus had to commit himself and his life and his will and his way all to someone else's keeping. Because he was more human than you are, and yet he was fully human as you are. No different. He sinned not is the only difference. And what did he do? He learned obedience, we're told in the scriptures, by the things that he suffered. We know that he was shamed at the cross, that he was crucified, stark naked, humiliated among all of humanity. Imagine God stark naked on a cross. Not a pretty picture. It's not something that you get taught a lot. It's not something that we go out, you know, as Bible teachers and say, hey, you know what? You find me a crucified person that was, you know, clothed, and I'll say, well, welcome to, you know, fantasy world. That's not the way they did it. Crucifixion was the most humiliating experience. And Jesus said that he was willing to endure the humiliation of the cross. And there used to be that meditation on the very fact of how God humbled himself to that level of being humiliated by being nailed to the cross and dying in front of all the people, exposed before all of humanity as the only deity that had come in the flesh, God Almighty. And he was willing to do that for you and me. So I really want to know what kind of faith you have. Because I know what kind of faith Jesus had. Jesus was willing to lose it all, gave it all, did it all, and accomplished it all. So I want to know what kind of faith you got. I mean, is it all or nothing? Or is it some or what? Are you like a 50-50 Christian? You know, half the time you got it, half the time you don't. Sometimes you got, you know, 40-hour work week to do. You know what I mean? If God sends you to work, fine. But did he? Have you talked to him? Or was it just one of those prayers of convenience? Well, you know, I got to get a job. So here's the first one that comes along. It was God's will. Okay. Ah, you know. Have you ever asked God, should you leave your job? What if God said, get up and go today? Like he did to Jesus. By whom you have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. Practically speaking, now, we already pretty much identified that, hey, we were saved, we got grace. We were given something free. We were extended something we didn't know that we had. We were given the opportunity to realize that God has done something for us, and we accept that he has given us the opportunity to be saved and to be presented faultless eventually before the Father because we've received grace. So by grace we're saved. And now we've been told to do something for apostleship because we are meant to be going forward and doing the things that Paul did, that Jesus did, that John did, that Mark did, that Luke did, that we were commissioned by the very great commission, we call it, 
by the very fact that Jesus said to go and teach all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father, that they were all meeting together in the book of Acts in the upper room, and that it wasn't just a few that were like, wow, imbued with the Holy Spirit, but they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and everyone was doing it, and gone out and accomplished it. Everyone. We only have recorded a few. As John said, if everything should be recorded and written down, hey, there wouldn't be volumes enough in heaven to detail everything that happened concerning and pertaining to Jesus Christ. But we see that and recognize in ourselves that being in the faith is one thing, but being of the faith is another. And what we put our faith in is what we're going to follow. And oftentimes we put our faith in fantasy football teams. We put our faith in our job. We put our faith in our wife. We put our faith in our constitution. We put our faith in politics. We put our faith in free enterprise. We put our faith everywhere else except in the one person that can save us from ourselves. The one person that has told us to deny ourselves, to take up our cross and to follow Jesus. We are, in fact, Roman. We are, in fact, Gentile. And I don't care if you're a Jew or not, you're still a Gentile. We are, in fact, of this that God has spoken to us. We have identified and we have found ourselves at a loss for the obedience to the faith. Because among all nations, the nations would not call us saved, would they? So, what are we doing? And who are we doing it for? We say we have faith, but are we doing it for his name? Oh. Oh. For his name for Jesus. What are you doing today for Jesus? What are you doing in your life today for God? What are you doing in your life, according to this scripture we've been given, for the sake of the name that you claim to be Christian? What are you doing? Are you for Christianity? Are you for Jesus? Or are you about something else? Are you about the town? Are you out and about the world? Are you about, you know, the latest car craze? Are you about the latest Christian music? Are you about the latest fad, fashion, form, format of worldliness and ungodliness, of sensuality and not spirituality? What are you for? Because I can look at you as this scripture says and tell you what you are for. I can watch you for five minutes and tell you what you're for. I can listen to you for ten minutes and tell you what you're for. Can you? Can you? Are you able to practically sit down and take this scripture and apply it to your life and say, I want to know what I'm for and if I'm in the faith? Write it down. Take the simple lesson of Christianity that we can all apply to ourselves. That we can all teach ourselves, we can all, without the Holy Spirit's help, even make real in our own life. What are you for? Listen to the words you say. Write them all down. Write all down the words. Write down the keywords. You know, keywords are things that the computer looks for, you know, in the terminology and in the locale. And it says, well, these certain keywords I'm going to pull up in a search so I can find what I'm looking for. I'm going to go find the Christians by the words that are used. So if I use a keyword search on a computer, Will I find you? Will I? What's your life about? What are you for? What comes out of your mouth? What are the words you use? What are the things you say? What are the things you do? Would they be identified as you for Jesus? You for God? You for Christ? You for Christianity? What is coming out of your mouth? What do you talk most about? What is the volume of the words that you use in the reality of the life you live? Because that's going to determine where you're at. If you're in the faith, or you're of the faith, or you're about the faith. <coughs> so practically speaking, who do you want to be for or against? Now I know what you're against. You're against the Muslim. You're against President Obama. You're against the government. You're against chemtrails, you're against, you know, the moon project, you're against the Mars project, you're against smoking, you're against meat, you're against fur, you're against animal cruelty, you're against, you know, um, 
freeing, you know, domesticated animals, you know, being, well, okay, maybe you're for them. You're for domesticated animals and making them into gods. You worship them? You know, you do, you animal lovers. You know, you're for a lot of things and you're against a lot. But what are you really for? I mean, I know in America, and just like the Romans were, they were for their games. They loved the Colosseum. They loved to go and see all the people because they would get hot dogs and beer and, you know, sit around and get half naked and have orgies afterwards. But, you know, during the games, oh, they were attentive to the games because everything was done for the people. It was done by the people for the people. As a matter of fact, the mobs of Rome later on said that we, the people, want for the people and by the people to have more games. Can I ask you, what are you doing with your games? Are you playing more games? Are you for Warcraft? Which now would be like Recon 22 or, you know, Stealth Shadow Wars or whatever it is that the latest, greatest, shoot em up, bang em up, knock em dead reality game show is out there or game that is for you to be a gamer? Is that really what you want to be for? A gamer? Do you want to stand before Jesus Christ and say, hey, check out my game score. I want to give you the scoreboard right now. You lose. Because it doesn't matter how much you won. You lost. You're a gamer. You wasted your time. It really is what we call technical masturbation. And that's all it is. It occupies you so that you're not preoccupied with doing what Jesus said to do. Because you're occupied with self-gratification. You're not denying yourself. You're not taking up your cross. You're not following Jesus. Welcome to America. 99% of America is that way. Selfish. Now, the degree to which we are selfish some people have less self than others. I'll admit that, you know, because I'm not going to say, you know, like Billy Graham is perfect. I'm not going to say he's not selfish. He is in his own little way, you know. But he's probably like a one degree selfishness, then a 99 degree selfishness like most of us are, or 99% selfishness like most of us are. As a matter of fact, most of us are pretty deceptive about our selfishness. You know, some of us use ministry to be selfish. Ooh. Don't touch base on ministry. Don't make Christianity part of that. You know, because I got my own little kingdom set up here. I got my own little will, my own little way. You know, I got my own little, you know, office and my own little, you know, fiefdom. You know, I got all these servants, you know, that are working for me, you know, to make me look good. Be careful. What are you doing for and who are you doing it for? And are you doing it for Jesus?